Chapter 11, The Gray Bloom of Youth. A quote from Gore Vidal. Naturally, like most men, I am attracted to adolescent males. This is, by the way, one of the best kept secrets of the male lodge, revealed in a study called The Boys of Boise, where most of the male establishment of that heartland Idaho city, each a mature married man, were revealed to be lovers of the high school football team. But I did not go prowling for 14-year-old athletes. After all, if the ideal is the other self, then that self would have to age along with me, and attraction would have become affection, and lust would have been diverted to chance encounters or the other sex." End quote. When I was 14, Chrysler culture told me to hate myself for liking 16-year-olds. I'll be damned if I listen again to that bullshit this time on the other side of the age divide, even if, the, even if this is tantamount to defending a taboo. Maybe the tools who tell me that consensual relationship between grown males of whatever age, of whatever duration, are wrong, would have more credibility if they refrained from raping the very same vulnerable teens their sex-phobic re rhetoric creates. Why do we give any credence to the morality of perverts who want to play peeping Tom in our consensual personal lives while they themselves either rape others or turn a blind eye? Bill Donahue, the president of the Catholic Avengers League, took out an ad in the New York Times criticizing that new newspaper for its allegedly slanted coverage on the Catholic sex abuse scandal, revealing an inability to distinguish between consensual sex and non-consensual rape. Quote, the Times continues to editorialize about the pedophilia crisis when all along it's been a homosexual crisis. Eighty percent of the victims of priestly sexual abuse are male, and most of them are post-pubescent. While homosexuality does not cause predatory behavior, and most gay priests are not molesters, most of the molesters have been gay, end quote. Donahue is correct that most of the victims are not prepubescent children. He is further correct that most of the abuse was same sex. However, that two penises were involved is not the problem, but the rape part. The only way in which this is a homosexual crisis is that the Catholic Church's policies on ordination encourages closeted gay men to become priests whose failures to extinguish their sexual desires pervert into non-consensual acts. After all, what's the only respectable job for a good Catholic boy who both believes the official line about the intrinsically disordered same-sex sex acts of grave depravity and needs not to have a wife. Problem solved. Of the five guys who became priests at the Catholic school I attended, all of them were suspected to be gay beforehand. Whereas 18 out of 20 gay Roman emperors is a mathematical impossibility, as we previously discussed, five out of five gay priests is really just what everyone has always suspected. Peter Hitchens, brother of Christopher, passes for a serious conservative commentator in Britain. Brain buddy of Donahue, the two share similar sentiments on the clerical sex abuse scandal. Quote, I will not be trapped into defending them. Their actions were atrocious, particularly because of who and what they are, and the Roman Catholic Church has been feeble in dealing with them. But it can hardly be claimed that they were the only people ever to abuse children sexually or to cover it up, or that they were in any way following the dictates of their church. In fact, most of this abuse involves homosexual assaults on pubescent boys of the kind, not remotely connected with religion, which occurred at my private school. This fact is neglected at least partly because it is no longer respectable to disprove of homosexuality as such, and many homosexual liberationists campaign for ever lower, ever lower ages of consent, which would bring such offenses perilously close to being legal, especially given the feebleness with which the current age of consent is policed. Yet the church is simultaneously criticized by its foes for being against homosexuality. Uh, Yet the church is simultaneously criticized by its foes for being against homosexual acts and for failing to act strongly enough to, against such acts committed against its own code by a minority of its own priests. There is a whiff of having it both ways here. End quote. Fags want to screw each other, but they want to arrest rapists? Come on, gays, let's have some consistency, you hypocrites. For this, Hitchens, it is logically indefensible to maintain the legality of consensual same-sex sex, but not of same-sex rape. 
The mind weeps at such nonsense. Like Donahue, Peter Hitchens does not understand that the problem with so-called homosexual rape is not the homosexual part. To him, same-sex sex is disgusting, rape is disgusting. As such, they are one and the same disgusting mess. He further conflates the issue of age of consent laws with the old boogeyman that faggots need to recruit the youngins because these predators cannot reproduce their own kind. Even the outright removal of age of consent or statutory rape laws would do nothing to nullify rape laws themselves, which is precisely why the former is not needed. Rape is rape regardless of age and genitalia. But the purpose of the age of consent laws is not stopping the predation of youngins. If it were, the law would have banned schools and churches a long time ago. Statutory rape laws deliberately discourage sexuality and especially the always wrong same-sex sexuality. Adolescents often look up to older men. They're bigger, stronger, and hence more attractive. This is why young boys like superheroes. And without cultural fiats, young men would like older men. Not grandfather old, but older in the sense of virility and strength. Role models for what men strive to be. As such, the age of consent laws are to make young adults feel guilty about feelings and thus nip the problem in the bud. There is quite a lot of truth to the Christers who insist that homosexuality is learned behavior. Gays laugh this off as ridiculous because they have felt that way since they were very little. But we are not but we are Greros, not gays who know that the main driver of the lack of sexuality between masculine men is culture, not genes. The Christers are right for once. We are coming for their husbands and sons. If adolescents had the option of same-sex relationships without the current stigma, you can bet the number of those reporting same-sex acts would be more than 5%, or whatever trifling number, and not predominantly made up of the effeminate minority, the gays. In fact, some high-profile Christers have openly acknowledged that they must brand masculine-masculine attraction as evil precisely because it is such an alluring option. Quote, If you isolate sexuality as something solely for one's own personal amusement, and all you want is the most satisfying orgasm you can get, and this is what homosexuality seems to be, then homosexuality seems too powerful to resist. The evidence is that men do a better job on men and women on women if all you are looking for is orgasm. It's pure sexuality. It's almost like pure heroin. It's such a rush. Marital sex tends towards the boring end. Generally, it doesn't deliver the same kind of sheer sexual pleasure that homosexual sex does." End quote. The quote above is not from a radical gay activist or even your faithful author. It is from fundamentalist Paul Cameron, a psychologist who wants to make same-sex acts illegal precisely because of how addictive they are. It makes perfect sense, then, that the age of consent laws, along with homophobia, exist precisely for the same puritanical reason as age, re as age restrictions, along with general prohibitions on alcohol and tobacco. To prevent hedonism. Whereas we agree with Christers that same-sex uh, same eroticism is contagious, consensual personal choices ought not to be under the purview of nutty theocrats. Such opinions about the desirability of same-sex sex are not confined to a single busybody. It was a well-known fact that same-sex attractions spread easily until relatively recently. A film, from, a, a film from the 1960s features a detective, John Sorensen, barking at student hostages. There may be some in this auditorium. There may be some here today that will be homosexual in the future. There are a lot of kids here. There may be some girls that will turn lesbian. We don't know. But it's serious. Don't kid yourselves about it. They can be anywhere. They can be judges, lawyers. We ought to know we've arrested all of them. So if any one of you have let yourself become involved with an adult homosexual or with another boy, and you're doing this on a regular basis, you better stop quick. Because one out of three of you will turn queer. And if we catch you involved with a homosexual, your parents are going to know about it first. And you will be caught. 
don't think you won't be caught. Because this is one thing you cannot get away with. This is one thing that if you don't get caught by us, you'll be caught by yourself. And the rest of your life will be a living hell. Dare to resist cock or else. We must stop the contagion, a point that a propaganda film, Boys Beware, from that decade harps on about. Quote, Then during lunch, Ralph showed him some pornographic pictures. Jimmy knew he shouldn't be interested, but, well, he was curious. What Jimmy didn't know is that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. End quote. What's curious is that both of these clips feature neither rape nor prepubescent boys. Both are consensual hypotheticals that reveal that the fear was not about the rape of small boys, but the contagion of pleasurable same-sex sex. And boys beware, while Ralph is quite a bit older than Johnny, there is absolutely no mention of coercion. In fact, Ralph is arrested, but Johnny himself is put on probation. Now, if Johnny is a poor little rape victim, the victim of an evil adult homosexual, why is he being punished? Precisely because it's a consensual contagion that must be exterminated. Bill O'Reilly recently echoed these infecting sentiments half a century later when commenting on the contagious series Glee. Here's the problem with it with a show like this, though. If you make the behavior of these people, uh, Carlson pointed to the sex tape. All right. Now, I, I didn't buy that for a second. Mm -hmm. They couldn't carry that off. You know, if a person makes a sex tape, if a teenager does, their lives are ruined. That's, it's over. They didn't take that seriously in this program. These girls are running around cheerleader outfits. It's like, oh, yeah, you made a sex tape. Uh-uh-uh. It was so unrealistic that I, I just, it just went over. But if children hear it, unsupervised children, okay, who don't have parents watching their me, they might go out and experiment with this stuff. Do you really think that this is the kind of thing that's contagious? That I if don't kids know. see this, that they're going to say, gee, right, let, I want to be a girl, let me tell you I'm not going to wear my when nice I, high I heels think, tonight. Wait, 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 wait. Let me answer Piero's question, Carlson, but I'll direct the, the, the query to you. When I was a teenager and I saw James Dean smoking, made me want to smoke. Sure, but that, that's a smoke. behavior. That's like a beer. Well, Not well, your well, sexuality. I, Bill, did no, you ever no, no, want to no. be a, a woman? A sex tape. Uh, did you? Well, on Thursdays, usually, <laughs> when I have the culture warriors, then I just I want to add. Think, and, uh, I, go I, ahead, I, I'm, go ahead. I'm not... I don't think that watching Glee is going to suddenly make kids want to be transgender or suddenly make them wake up one morning and say that they're going to be... But experimentation. experimentation. I'm with you on this, Bill, because I wholeheartedly believe in today's society that kids are experimenting with homosexuality. We see it in celebrities who maybe if they make it just do it on the side, if they make it and it glamorous, may be drug there's a certain There are a certain percentage of children, if they make it glamorous. We have a Madonna thing coming up, by the way, that, that might reinforce this point. If only Bill O'Reilly knew that James Dean didn't just put cigarettes in his mouth. While O'Reilly conflates gay homosexuality and Guerrero, we understand his point even if we feel insulted by the implication that somehow same-sex sex is bad. In fact, we should run billboards featuring attractive men like James Dean with just the word Guerrero. It will be more successful than selling underwear the same way. That's no joke. We have to again recognize that Guerrero is not gay. Guerrero, gay is an inflexible gender, whereas the only way to explain 90% of the Roman emperors is to acknowledge the unseen but huge role culture has had in veering male sexuality away from itself. I did not include the Catholic molestation scandal as a cheap but much deserved diss against a hypocritical organization. But there is a connection between homosexuality as an alluring contagion and the attitude in Bill Donahue's insistence that the problem with the Catholic sex abuse scandal is homosexual sex and not rape. Think about it. The evil, according to these people, is not really rape, but the homosexuality overall, regardless of consensuality. Consensual sex is actually worse than rape because the former encourages more sex. The overarching villain, this invented homosexuality that's actually referring to the contagious subtype Guerrero, can only spread consensually as rape is rather unpleasant. Consensual sex is worse than rape because rape victims at least will not enjoy it and therefore will not continue seeking it out. Such is the evil from rotten minds of the moral crusaders that passes on for morality. 
This fear of an appealing same-sex erotic hook for young initiates into sins against nature takes us back centuries. A single example shall, suffi sh shall suffice. In the Genovese theocracy under Nudar John Calvin, the crime of sodomy covered child molestation of boys, sexual assaults against men by men, and consensual acts between males without any distinction between ages and consent, though those younger were generally less harshly punished like Johnny and boys beware, and for the same reasons. Concerning the punishment of three youths convicted of, quote, one of the most atrocious and abominable crimes, end quote, Taliban Calvin ponders about the leniency of drowning instead of burning them, but decides on metting out just public beating or Jesus hugs. Quote, to show them mercy, it still seems that they cannot be excused from a public and exemplary physical punishment. Hiding this crime is impossible. There is a greater danger and scandal in not punishing the crime or hiding the punishment than in a public and exemplary punishment. Therefore, as a compromise, we suggest that the three older boys should be beaten publicly in the city streets with a rope around their necks. They should be threatened with the same if they reoffend. After the beating, they should be left in terror for some time, publicly chained up wh wherever you think best. Later, they should be jailed on bread and water, and if you think best, their relatives can guard them, warning them about what will happen if they reoffend." Who are the real child molesters? If same-sex sex is so undesirable and so unnatural, why do such acts had to have been punished via public execution or torture? Maybe because they're so desirable and natural that you have to physically hurt people to get them to stop. And that brings us back to situational homosexuality. The moral totalitarians lording over us can no longer use a stick, so they prefer, they prefer a, more use, a more peaceful tool. Situational homosexuality is the modern tool used to steer people back to exclusive heterosexuality. It has been as effective as its predecessor. Given that we cannot burn or physically intimidate those not following the party line anymore, the lapsed heterosexual, like Dusty from MTV, gets a chance to come back to the fold. It was just temporary! I was doing it for money! There weren't women and I forgot how to masturbate! As long as this mantra is repeated, the prodigal son rebukes the heretic sexuality and is welcomed back as he shares in the communion of the fascist heterosexual orthodoxy. As we have seen, same-sex desires have always been viewed in the Christian West as evil, but more importantly as contagious. Anita Bryant and her Save Our Children crusade ran brochures asking, are homosexuals trying to recruit our children? To rid themselves of any accusations that they were sexually interested in the rather nebulous range of children, which could mean toddler or 17-year-old, gays made a pact with the devil. In an attempt to gain legitimacy from the family values crowd, the same ones who disown their gay kids, the gays disowned their own kids and drew a clear line between sexable adults and off-limit on adults, usually under 18 or somewhere near that. What have the results been of confirming to fascist ethics? Dead gay teens, lots of them. Why are gay teens killing themselves if not because they have no one who is like them? Young gays feel the same self-imposed young gays feel the young gays feel the self-imposed isolation agreed to upon by their gay elders who should know better as they themselves were young at one point. For what? To keep the Chrysler notion alive that 16-year-old Johnny is a sexually sterile but being because sex is so yucky? Gays should stop seeking the affirmation they will never get from bigots that despise them at the cost of dead teens. We should not make the same myopic mistake that gays have. Guerrero is something I wish to have read when I was in high school instead of explaining it now. As such, the overthrow of the immoral standards governing sex between and with young adults is as crucial to Guerrero as exposing the Levitical invention and the later 19th century reinvention of hom homosexuality. If we do not challenge these fallacies, we are guilty we are guilty of turning our backs on not just our past selves, but the very genesis of the problem we face now. 
Without the anti-masculine prohibition instilled in youth, there would be no need for Guerrero now as it would naturally unfold in the absence of the prohibitions. I am not advocating sex between young adults or sex with, with young adults or even sex between adults. I am advocating that the decision to have sex be made by the parties involved and not a third party like the motley group of busybodies, thieves, liars, and charlatans who fashion themselves as the state or church or any of their numerous peeping Tom agents leering into your bedroom. If teens are routinely tried as adults for crimes, they should enjoy all the rights and privileges of adulthood, not just the responsibilities. And those rights pertain not only to sex. Without the freedom of contract, teens with abusive or unsupportive parents have no recourse to escape their involuntary bondage. We care so much about the children that in many states it's still legal for a teacher to assault a 16-year-old if the assault is called spanking. Such an attack is both premeditated and coercive, but any self-defense would not be excused. And yet, the same 16-year-old cannot legally have consensual sex with his 18-year-old boyfriend. Molesting young adults is legal. Them deciding to have sex with someone they like is not. They cannot consent to refuse hate. They cannot consent to love. The real assaulter goes free. The lover goes to prison. So who are the real sickening child molesters? The perverts who support these laws, whether they're John Calvin, his current priestly reincarnations, politicians who pass their laws, or the sadistic cops, prosecutors, judges, and juries who enforce them. Greek pederastia. Quote, his 16th year, he seemed to be both as much boy as man. Both boys and girls looked to him to make love, and yet that slender figure of proud Narcissus had little feeling for either boys or girls. End quote. As discussed above, what goes under the guise of protecting children is actually quite the opposite. It's about keeping in line those with more responsibility than children proper, but less rights and privileges than those considered fully adults. Teens routinely get charged as adults for crimes, yet many are not eligible to drive, drink, or make contracts. So-called adolescents get treated as adults or children based on convenience to the powers that be, society, parents, teachers. And make no mistake, it is about power. If you commit a crime as a minor but get tried as an adult, the real adults, society, parents, teachers, do not have to look in the mirror for their failure of poor parenting. Anything bad you do is your fault. But when the young adult wants to take this principle of personal responsibility and establish his independence, sex, drinking, making a business, driving, roadblocks must be erected. If society does not have someone to bully or lord over, what will these sadists do? They, must, they may have to stare into the empty abyss that is their shrunken souls. Because the ancient Greeks confirmed more rights rather than just one-sided responsibilities onto young adults, modern propaganda has cast them with sullied reputations as uncivilized child molesters. Greek pederastia conjures up the image of a balding man in a trench toga with a windowless horse cart abducting young children. They understood that sexually active teens were not children in any sense of our conflated word minor, and specified that proper and specify that the proper lover should be old and wise enough. Quote, Those who start a love affair with boys who are nearly grown up and old enough to think for themselves are prepared, I think, to be friends and live together for life. The others are deceivers who take advantage of youthful folly and then quite cheerfully abandon their victims in search of others. There ought to be a law against loving young boys to stop so much energy being expended on uncertain end. End quote. Plato's reference to young boys is not an explicit prohibition of pedophilia, but rather those sexually capable but just starting puberty. Of course, if the proper age for proper relationships is a few years after that, pedophilia is necessarily excluded from virtuous relationships. And yet, such disclaimers did not prevent the later bans on all same-sex sex, regardless of age, or associations with rape and child molesting. Why? When you cede to others the right to judge more than just the consensuality of relationships, you allow the slippery slope towards complete prohibition. 
If you grant the right to the state to regulate alcohol or drugs, it's not a surprise that the state may ban them altogether. But then Grero faces the original problem the Greeks wanted to avoid. What about prepubescent boys? How does one hold on to consensuality as the guiding principle and cornerstone of justice without advocating pedophilia or erring on the side of child abusers? I'm genuinely puzzled by the suggestion that without the blanket prohibition of certain consensual acts via the age of consent, little boys will be legally diddled. When I was an actual boy, I was aware of my penis, but not in a sexual way. It was not until puberty that I desired sex or had the functioning equipment. I can't imagine why children would give consent to something they are not capable of. Are, the, are there hordes of prepubescent children who want sex anyways? Could they be coerced? Sure, but that's called rape. And what about Plato's young boys, those early into pubescence? Don't older people get it fooled? Why should the state be matchmaker? Why do we assume all young adults are clueless idiots? Is this a confession that eight years of state-funded education for a 14-year-old have been wasted because it cannot provide even the most rudimentary interpersonal skills? Or is this a confession that parents are worthless and cannot instill virtue in their children since they lack it themselves? Given that rape is rape and there is no desire on the part of prepubescent children to have sex, the age of consent is a solution to a problem that simply does not exist. It's one more control in the busybody toolbox to break the emergent independence of young adults. If those teens get used to this freedom thing, they'll be hard to rein in as adults. If they can bully you into submission now, they can break you into accepting other coercive situations like taxes, mandatory schooling, state-approved licensing, and a plethora of hidden controls. NAMBLA has not helped the matters, has not helped the matters to say the least. The pedophiles at the North American Man-Boy Love Association make the case that consent is all that matters, ignoring the question of how sexually immature children can give consent to something they are biologically not ready for. Upon closer inspection, we see what their agenda is. Just as the current system conflates many unrelated types of same-sex sex under homosexuality, NAMBLA conflates liking 7-year-olds with 17-year-olds. To them minor, is really anyone under 18 without any distinctions. Their goal is to confuse the attraction to young adults in full bloom with attraction to children obviously incapable of sex. For example, the picture on top of their 15 famous men who had boy lovers showed, shows Oscar Wilde with Lord Alfred Douglas. The picture dates from 1893 when Wilde was 39 and Douglas 23. So Nambla's poster, Boy, is in reality a man over the American legal drinking age. Where's the boy? Are they counting in dog ears, perhaps? Nambla wants to ride the coattails of the defensible only to sneak in the indefensible. They fail at the latter just in danger the former. They hide their true intent of kitty diddling behind a parade of consensual relationships with young and often unambiguously fully grown men. All in all, Nambla is reprehensible. The Greeks' ideal relationship was age disparate. The younger partner was in his teens and the older in his 20s, generally before a later marriage in his 30s, not quite a creepy old man hunting down prepubescent children. There is nothing prescriptive, though, about this aspect of their culture that we must imitate or, for that matter, avoid. If equality includes some considered in the gray zone, so be it. They, the busybodies, not reality, be damned. The Greeks themselves did not hold fast and furious to their idealized structure. This was implicitly acknowledged by arguing whether Achilles was older or younger than Patroclus, or explicitly in Plato's uh, Phaedrus. Youth delights youth, as the old f proverb runs, because I suppose friendship grows from similarity as boys of the same age go after the same pleasures. As such, the Greeks themselves were open to same age relationships. But why did the Greeks idealize pederastia? Greenberg explains the role of competitiveness, quote, Male competitiveness poses a further culture, ob culture obstacle to an egalitarian relationship. 
the, tw the 12th century Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus makes this point when telling of two pirates who were so careful to preserve temperance that they are supposed never to have resorted to intoxicating liquor, afraid that continence, a great bond between courageous men, might be forcibly shattered if they overindulge. If men are accustomed to compete with one another for status and conceive of sex in terms of domination, then egalitarian relations must be asexual if they are to continue." End quote. But that's not really male competitiveness, is it? It's just cultural inhibitions. Whereas our society limits sex to between men and women, their society preferred sex to be between men and young men, perhaps to add a pedagogical justification to signify that such relationships were more than just sex. Also, note the assumption that courageous men have to force themselves not to fuck each other because they are irresistible to each other. A simpler explanation may be aesthetics. Have you seen Greek men? At 16, they turn into werewolves. Thus, lamenting a young man's first beard is then perfectly understandable. Quote, Just now, as his beard appears laden, beautiful and cruel to lovers, himself loves a boy. Nemesis is quick indeed. End quote. Though some relationships survive this traumatic metamorphosis, proving that such relationships were in fact more than just sexual. Quote, Although your furs down, turning to hair springs from you, and soft blonde tendrils are upon your temples, not therefore do I abandon my beloved. Yet his beauty is my own, even bearded, even with hair. End quote. There are valid concerns about institutionalized pederasty as distinct from mere individual age disparate relationships. Group, groups and cultures have a way of imposing their, their will on others, even if the force is subtle and not outright coercive. Namely, we know of hazing in fraternities and the fagging system in British schools. Both are hierarchical, dominant, submissive paradigms with same-sex sexual overtones in which the younger members serve the older ones. Neither are worthy of emulation. Was the Cretan mock kidnapping anything like the heterosexual bride kid kidnapping in uh, Kyrgyzstan as documented by Vice, TV, Vice News? We do know that the Greeks, even before the Stoics, placed a great deal of emphasis on sexual self-restraint. Socrates is held up as virtuous when he refused the advances of a young man, for example. The Cretan tradition could very well have been just a symbolic cover against the charge of promiscuity. The question is whether the younger man could refuse. Greek plates show young men rejecting suitors, and many poems by sperm, spurned lovers imply that rejection was a reality. These are then at least a, a few good reasons to think that Greek pederastia was not necessarily coercive. And even if it was as bad as Kyrgyzstan's bride kidnapping, we have three inescapable conclusions. First, what to make of the heterosexist hypocrisy. Greek men married in their 30s young teenage girls. Why is, that, why is it that none of the Christers today have outrage against that Greek practice? Well, because when the ancient Greek writings resurfaced during the Victorian era, the men routinely married young girls too. Nonetheless, individualistic self-respect is the vaccine against coercive relationships of whatever combination of genitalia. Second, we are not reenactors. Guerrero is masculine likes masculine, an inherent equality between partners and people. Third, whatever the ultimate nature of such relationships, they still unequivocally show male male attraction. Only in our moron culture can we ask why men are attracted to other men, especially younger men. Why not? What's unattractive about them? Culture tells young men to be ashamed of themselves. Their dicks are too small and they should spend all their time pursuing unappreciative cunts who enjoy romantic comedies, shopping at the mall, and being insufferable. Their dicks are just fine and they'd be much better off with men like themselves instead of competing with each other, denigrating themselves by currying for favor with the effeminate. 